How's it going guys? So we have a clip here for murmurs for step one, step two. Okay, you got to know basic high yield points here. So fixed splitting of S2 is ASD. I'm not going to spend 20 minutes talking about why we have the fixed splitting of the S2, but this is a passable descriptor that they will say in 14 out of 15 questions for ASD. Wide splitting means right ventricular hypertrophy. So if we have fixed wide splitting, that means right ventricular hypertrophy due to an ASD. So we have blood moving from the left atrium to the right atrium. That blood has to go through the right ventricle, more preload. We can get right ventricular hypertrophy, fixed wide splitting. So a flow murmur, a benign flow murmur can sometimes be seen. We have increased heart rate, increased preload, increased preload from an ASD, increased preload from pregnancy, for instance, where expansion of plasma volume 50% by second trimester, and or anemia, where you have increased cardiac output to try to compensate for the low oxygen in the blood. So any type of uh, cause of a flow murmur, you can get a systolic murmur, and it's not a valvular abnormality, okay? But students will often be confused, but it's especially I yield for 2CK level stuff. Formula valet is present in the fetal circulation. It's an opening between the right atrium and the left atrium. So that should close at birth and slash in the first week of life, leaving the leaving the form uh, fossa ovalis. Okay. So if it remains patent, we call it a PFO, patent form of valet. It's just a type of ASD. So if you saw fixed splitting of S2, you could have an answer, patent form of valet. Don't confuse with patent ductus arteriosus, which is a continuous machinery like murmur. US Simile loves these oxygen diagrams for some of the cardiac abnormalities. Now you can see here that we have 73% oxygen tension in the blood in, this, in the SVC, and somehow we have a step up in oxygen between the SVC and the right atrium, which is impossible unless we somehow have that ASD there, right? So blood's moving from the left, oxygen blood moving from the left atrium to the right atrium, and that's how we have that step up in oxygen tension. But they can show you a diagram like this for steps one and two, okay? And you got to know passable that that's ASD there. Paradoxical emboli, students get hysterical about weird things, even though exceedingly low yield, but I'm mentioning it because if I don't, well, I mean, it's an elephant in the room, right? That you can have a DVT that will normally embolize from the, the venous circulation to the lungs cause uh, pulmonary embolism, but if you have a, a valve, uh, sorry, a septal defect, ASD or a VSD for that matter, but usually an ASD, uh, that uh, clot can pass into the left heart and then into the arterial circulation, go to the brain and cause stroke. So you just have to know that that's possible. Ventricular septal defect described as a whole stalag murmur, usually at the lower left sternal border. Okay, it's just a high yield descriptor you got to know. And they can, they can throw in other findings, such as a diastolic rumble from uh, volume reverberation within the ventricles. It's on the NBME exam. If you think it's weird, don't take up the me. Take up the NBME. So enlarged left atrium, because if you have more blood uh, going from the left ventricle to the right ventricle, that has to pass the pulmonary circulation of the left atrium. So that can cause left atrial dilatation. And then a VSD can be part of tetralogy of Fallot. Okay, so pulmonic stenosis, VSD overriding aorta, and then of course your right ventricular hypertrophy there usually part of uh, DeGeorge syndrome, okay, 22Q11 deletion, T-cell deficiency. So VSD is repaired. There's an NBME question floating around where they tell you a patch was placed uh, repairing a VSD and what's going to happen to the pressures. And well, if blood's not moving from the left ventricle to the right ventricle, then pressure would build up in the left ventricle increases. Well, now you have a decrease in preload in the right ventricle, so right ventricular pressure decreases. Left atrium is the hard one. If we don't have that extra preload going through the pulmonary circulation, then the pressure in the left atrium would decrease as well. Uh, VSD is not cyanotic at birth, okay? That, you, you just got to know that. And later in life when we have Eisenmenger syndrome, which I'll talk about, but Eisenmenger syndrome is where you have a reversal of that shunt right to left. Uh, as I said, I'll discuss it in more detail, but that will be when the patient becomes cyanotic, usually years later, okay? If they tell you that a kid has a VSD, uh, but that there's a murmur present at one week, but it was not present at birth, the answer they want is increased pulmonary vascular resistance at birth, okay? And likewise, if they say, why was the murmur, why is the murmur loud at a week later, but it wasn't present at birth, the answer is you have decreased pulmonary vascular resistance a week later, okay? So at birth, because there's increased resistance, the lungs haven't opened up yet, that left to right shunt across the VSD, you have higher pressure on the right side. So that left to right gradient of pressure, high to low, is not as salient. But then as the pulmonary vascular resistance decreases, as the lungs open up, that left to right pressure gradient increases. 
So the murmur sound will increase. As I just fucking said, I mean, it's one or the other, conversely. So you got to just conceptually understand that. And they like these oxygen diagrams once again. Well, here you can see that uh, you have a step up between the right atrium and the right ventricle, which is impossible unless you have blood, oxygenated blood moving from the left ventricle to the right ventricle to VSD. And I should have mentioned before, because some of you are probably like, what the hell? Why is there 99% oxygen in the pulmonary veins, but 96% in the left atrium? This is because of the Thebesian veins, which drain the myocardium itself. And that deoxygenated blood will empty not only into the right atrium, but into some of the other chambers of the heart, including the left atrium. And this 99 to 96% step down is on the NBME exam. So it's not my opinion, but students will ask about that. And then the Eisenmender, as I said, I'll talk, I will talk about it more just now, which you can see that uh, we have a step down in oxygen from the left atrium to the left ventricle, where the only way that's possible is if we have deoxygenated blood moving from the right ventricle to the left ventricle here. Okay, so, so the only way that's possible is if we have blood moving, uh, deoxygenated blood moving from the right ventricle to the left ventricle here. Okay, so what's going to happen is you have over time that left to right shunt across the VSD, that increased preload going through the pulmonary circulation. Well, the pulmonary vessels are going to hypertrophy to limit that excess preload, which is going to cause pulmonary hypertension, increase afterload on the right ventricle, leading to right ventricular hypertrophy, and then ultimately an equalization of the pressures between the ventricles and a reversal of the shunt right to left. So this doesn't occur at birth, right? It's, it's non-cyanotic at birth, but years later, it's going to become cyanotic. Now, AVSD, atrioventricular septal defect, low yield for you assimilating. I'm just mentioning it because if I don't, then some students will ask about it. You just need to know that endocardial cushion defect with Down syndrome in a vacuum technically refers to AVSD, but I've never seen NBME assess this or this murmur, okay? But endocardial cushion defect can refer to AVSD as well as just ASD and VSD, okay? So just know that it's possible and know that it exists. Mitral regurgitation, so exceedingly high yield. Almost always it's going to be just holosystolic or systolic, all right? And but I mentioned that there's an offline NBME 20 question, which I contend is an erratum where they say mid-systolic, okay? It's hard to teach this stuff if there's an exception for everything. So I'm just letting you know that 29 out of 30 times, it's whole systolic or just regular systolic. Okay, most questions are not gonna mention the aortic or the mitral regurg radiating to the axilla. Uh, maybe a quarter of questions tops will mention it, but uh, students often think that you have to see that, you don't. So the highest who cause of mitral regurg and US MLA is going to be post-MI papillary or papillary muscle rupture. So if they tell you patient had MI hours to days ago, doesn't matter the time frame, and now has a four on six holosystolic murmur with dyspnea, that's ruptured papillary muscle with mitral regurg. Acute, seen acutely with rheumatic heart disease, okay, streptogenes, group A strep, and then you get uh, antibodies against M protein cross-reactive mitral valve. So mitral regurg acutely, and then years later, Yes, the, the valve scars over, causes mitral stenosis. Mitral regurg can be caused by general ischemia, dilated cardiomyopathy. You could just know that. JVD, this is interesting, okay? Because JVD is obviously a right heart failure finding. And just means the right heart can't fill, right? So jugular venous distension, peripheral edema. But there's a couple questions. I said step one NVMEs, but it's on step two also. But um, if you have left-sided pathology, e.g. mitral regurg, and it backs up to the lungs, backs up to the right heart, you could, in theory, get JVD as a result. Okay, so I'm just letting you know that there's a couple mitral regurg questions floating around the NBMEs where they say JVD. All right, so don't be confused by that. And then, of course, for 2CK slash step three, I'll just throw in here that if what we normally do exercise stress tests prior to surgery in patients with cardiovascular risk factors to ascertain perioperative MI risk. There's a question floating around one of the surge forms where they tell you the patient's a smoker and you're like, well, that's not good. They tell you the patient does not get shortness of breath with exertion, does not have any chest pain and has mitral regurg. And the answer is no further studies indicated. Okay. And stress test is wrong, which is, it's a hard question, but I'm just letting you know that that exists. But of course, if the patient does have heart failure signs, if the patient does get shortness of breath with exertion, does get ischemia with chest pain, then yes, you'd want to do uh, a pre-op exercise stress test to assess perioperative MI risk. You could do pharmacologic stress tests as well, but I usually exercise stress tests. Mitral stenosis usually described as a rumbling diastolic murmur. 
with an opening snap, okay? So it can be a mid to late decrescendo diastolic murmur. And you should be aware that an S4, and I'll do another presentation talking about the heart sounds more specifically, but an S4 is almost always the left ventricle, and it's a stiff left ventricle due to afterload, systemic hypertension, aortic stenosis. But you can have uh, left, left heart pathology backing all the way up to the right heart. The same way we get JV, JVD with MR, or M MR, as I talked about, you could get the JVD with MS. And I've also seen questions where they say right-sided S4 with MS. I'm just letting you know it exists, okay? where they'll give you mitral stenosis, like easy. They'll say history of rheumatic heart disease, four on six rumbling diastolic murmur. You're like, definitely mitral uh, stenosis here. And you're like, why is there an S4 though? Well, it's not the left ventricle, it's the right ventricle. Okay, so 99% of mitral stenosis due to history of rheumatic heart disease. Okay, so there's a question floating around you should be aware of. It's actually one of the two CK forms. Uh, where they hand you the diagnosis of mitral stenosis, history of rheumatic heart disease, uh, rumbling diastolic murmur, and then they explicitly say there's no opening snap. And that's like that's very audacious on their end. But I'm letting you know the question exists. It's out there, okay? And then the other demographic you have somebody likes apart from overt uh, rheumatic heart disease is they'll give you a pregnant woman a uh, second trimester who has dyspnea, and a diastolic murmur, and that's mitral stenosis, okay? So it was subclinical. She, she obviously had uh, rheumatic fever as a kid, but they won't mention it in the stem. They'll just say like, uh, and, and the implication is that she had subclinical mitral stenosis, that it, it hadn't been brought out symptomatically yet, but that the increase in plasma volume of 50% by second trimester is what made it clinical. So choose mitral stenosis is what I'm saying for second trimester pregnancy with dyspnea. It's not peripartum cardiomyopathy, which occurs later. Now, well, there's 1% remaining, right? So that's non-bacterial thrombotic endocarditis, uh, NBTE. So it can be malignancy from hyperclogable state. For whatever reason, it can cause these ver verrucous vegetations on both sides of the mitral valve. And it can also be SLE with antiphospholipid syndrome, where that can also lead to uh, the verrucous vegetations in the valve. So much valve prolapse, MVP, most common murmur uh, seen in about one in 100 of the population, asymptomatic, okay, so it's just mid-systolic click, and like somatis or mic somatis degeneration is a buzzy term that shows up in some stems that refers to tissue degeneration, Marfan syndrome, ehlers stanlos and it's almost always asymptomatic. There's a question one of the two CK forms. Uh, where they want you to know something called mitral valve prolapse syndrome, holy shit, where it can rarely be symptomatic. And they'll say a patient, usually in their 20s or 30s, has a history of 30-ish episodes of fleeting chest pain on the left side, and her dad died, or her uncle died from an MI. And you're like, well, that's definitely bad, but it's not. Um, that's what they say in the stem. It's actually pretty audacious and trolling that they say the uncle died of MI. But the answer is no uh, treatment necessary. So you need to know if there's a mid-systolic click, and it's a youngish patient, 20s to 30s, and there's history of many episodes of fleeting chest pain, as they describe it. That's mitral valve prolapse syndrome, and they don't want you to treat it. In theory, you could use beta blocker, but beta blocker was wrong uh, on that question. They just wanted no treatment. And then they like being audacious with panic disorder questions. So they'll give you a 19-year-old male who's hyperventilating, and he's having a panic attack, and they say that there's a they mention that there's a mid systolic click and they say which of the following is the most likely explanation for the patient's presentation and MVP is wrong, student's confused, and it's like, well, yes, the patient has MVP, but that's not the cause of the patient's acute presentation. It's clearly panic attack here. So just be aware they like doing that on USMLA and that MVP doesn't progress to mitral regurge, okay, that they're actually completely separate. Aortic regurge, it's a holodiastolic murmur. It's an early, it can be described as early diastolic, decrescendo diastolic murmur. Okay, it's loudest after S2, that's when diastole starts. So S1 to S2 is systole, and after S2, that's diastole. There's a wide pulse pressure. Okay, big difference between systolic and diastolic pressure. Head bobbing, bounding pulses, because blood is collapsing out of the aorta back into the left ventricle. So they love this wide pulse pressure. You gotta be on the lookout for that in questions. And they can describe it as brisk upstroke with precipitous downstroke. Or let us say the pulses are brisk. That can be one way to imply the bounding pulses, okay? And so about 80% of the time, the bounding pulses are going to be aortic reurge. But you can just be aware that for panic ductus arteriosus, 
And for AV fistulae, you can also get bounding pulses. So it's just blood leaving the arterial circulation quickly. So in AR, it's collapsing out of the aorta back in the ventricle, bounding pulses. In PDA, it's leaving the aorta for the for the patent ductus arteriosus uh, for the uh, pulmonary trunk, and that's going to be bounding pulses. And for AV fistula, it's leaving the arterial circulation for the venous circulation, bounding pulses. So just be aware that it's possible in those other two conditions. Highest yield cause of AR in US is aortic dissection with retrograde propagation toward the aortic root, causing aortic root dilatation. See it in Marfan syndrome, Ehler Stanlos, as I talked about before. Much valve prolapse, most common, but they can get aortic regurge. Volume overload in the left ventricle, aortic regurge can cause, leading to eccentric hypertrophy, where the myocardial sarcomeres are laid in series, okay? whereas concentric hypertrophy from increased afterload is going to be where the myocardial fibers are laid in parallel. Okay, then aortic stenosis mid-systolic murmur, which is the same thing as crescendo, decrescendo, and um, they can also describe it as a late peaking systolic murmur with an ejection click. Don't confuse that with mid-systolic click of mitral valve prolapse. And uh, It radiates the carotids quite often in questions. I would say maybe at least 60% of questions, whereas the mitral regurgitation in contrast was only about 25% of the time, I'd say it radiates the axilla. But the radiation of the carotids is exceedingly high yield for aortic stenosis. Causes slow rising pulses, okay, so pulses parvus et tardis. Uh, don't confuse that with the bounding pulses of AR. So AR, we said bounding pulses, wide pulse pressure, okay, whereas uh, brisk upstroke with precipitous downstroke, AR, whereas AS is uh, pulses parvus et tardis, slow rising pulses. Aortic stenosis, SAD, syncope, angina, dyspnea, so just be aware that those are associated and that they're indications for valve replacement as well. Bicuspid aortic valve need not be Turner syndrome, okay? So you need to know it's usually autosomal dominant, can easily occur in males, and it can occur in pediatrics as well. And in fact, it does in the immune forms. This is one of the most annoying points when I teach students in that schools erroneously teach students that bicuspid aortic valve presents as cal uh, calcification, usually in the 40s, and that's when it will present. It's fucking wrong, okay? So bicuspid aortic valve, autosomal dominant, can present any age. They'll give you a three-month-old. I'm not joking, okay? They'll give you a three-month-old on the NBME, e.g. for pediatrics forms, and they'll say that there's uh, a four-on-six systolic murmur radiating to the carotids and answers bicuspid valve, and the student's like, oh, I, but I thought bicuspid valve like wasn't symptomatic until like they're an adult or like age 40 or something. It's like, it's fucking wrong. Okay, it pisses me off because uh, based on the the frequency, the prevalence at which students are taught that, it's fucking wrong. Okay, as I, as I just harped on, I mean, it can occur in a high schooler, it can occur in pediatrics, and then you're going to do a valve replacement if the cross sectional area is under a centimeter squared. There's a surgery form where they say it's 0 0.8 centimeters squared and it's valve replacement, or if there's syncope and giant dyspnea. Tricuspid regurg theoretically would sound like mitral regurg where you have whole systolic murmur but because it's the right side of the heart it's going to increase with inspiration so when you inspire decrease intrathoracic pressure increase ability of blood to return to the right heart so the more volume there is going to accentuate murmur so they, they like this description you, you it can cause a pulsatile liver just be aware they, that can show up occasionally in questions but this is the point here that the highest yield cause of Tricuspid regurg and US simile is pulmonary hypertension slash core pulmonale. They are obsessed with this, okay? Not pulmonic regurg for whatever fucking reason. It's tricuspid regurg, okay? So they'll give you a dude with 100 pack your history of smoking, COPD, and they'll say, whole systolic murmur that increases the inspiration two on six. And I'm like, what is that to the student? And they're like, I don't know. And I'm like, well, it's whole systolic increased inspiration. So after we cover the basic murmur, which is tricuspid regurg, I'm like, well, why is it there? They're like, I don't know. I'm like, well, the highest yield cause of tricuspid regurg and US simile is pulmonary hypertension slash core pulmonale. It's like this magical fucking factoid for students. It's like exceedingly high yield. Now, this is also interesting that you would think IV drug user endocarditis causing tricuspid lesions would be an exceedingly high yield etiology. I don't think I've ever seen it show up on US simile. I'm serious. Carcinoid syndrome, okay, that can show up. Uh, causing tricuspid lesions, so carcinoid tumor, bronchial, small bowel, appendiceal, small blue cells, S1 under positive, secrete serotonin, uh, diagnosed with 5-HIA in the urine, uh, diaphoresis, tachycardia, okay, flushing, but that can lead to tricuspid lesions. Tricuspid stenosis, non-existent in Yosemite, you could just theoretically know. Perhaps it could sound the same as mitral stenosis, right, where it would be a rumbling diastolic murmur, but it would be on the 
the right side of the heart, never seen it assessed though. Pulmonic regurg, as I said, it's it's not associated with uh, hyper pulmonary hypertension, uh, core pulmonale, okay? But uh, we have tricus regurg associated. But it would, in theory, it would sound the same as aortic uh, regurgitation. We would think that it would be an early diastolic murmur. Notice that I haven't fixated on the valve locations in this presentation, okay? Like aortic being the uh, second intercostal space, right sternal border, pulmonic being the second intercostal space, left sternal border, tricuspid, lower left sternal border, usually fifth intercostal space, uh, mitral being the fourth intercostal space, left midclavicular line, slightly medial. That, but they, they don't care about locations so much, actually. They can be uh, somewhat variable across questions. That's why you don't want to pigeonhole things. Pulmonic stenosis, okay. I don't think I've ever seen it show up in isolation. It'll just be part of tetralogy of flow. As you said, pulmonic stenosis, right ventral hypertrophy, VSD overriding aorta. I'll make another presentation talking about that stuff, okay. Um, and once again, it would just theoretically sound like aortic stenosis, mid systolic murmur, but at the second or costal space, um, left sternal border rather than right. And then I'm going to do a part two presentation where I do heart sounds, splitting, other things, a coarctation, PDA, tragia flow, more specifically. Okay. Um, because this can be a lengthy presentation. We could do, some of you want that. Some of you are like, yeah, give me a 90 minute murmur presentation. I'm for it. Okay. But I mean, I'm going to chop things up a bit, uh, not dramatic. All right. But I'll do, I'll do that other presentation for you guys. All right. Uh, you know the deal. I'm going to make more content. If you like my stuff, subscribe to my channel. Appreciate your time. That's it.